Hello, everyone. Thank you for viewing this presentation. My name is Philip Shepard, and I am the store manager for Time Laboratories Fido Aromatherapy Shop and Wellness Center in Pocatello, Idaho. I am an aromatherapy enthusiast and love working with essential oils, and I'm here today to give you a basic introduction to aromatherapy. Um, I've worked for Time Laboratories for a few years now. We were one of the first companies in the United States to practice aromatherapy. We were founded in 1973 by Miss Anne-Marie Bueller. Um, I work directly under Annette Davis, who is the president of Time Laboratories, as well as the president of the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy, and who is the granddaughter of our founder, Miss Anne-Marie Bueller. Um, I enjoy working with essential oils. I use them every day in so many different ways. And I'm just excited to share my love of aromatherapy with you. So let's get started. So today our focus is going to be exploring a brief history of aromatherapy. The uh, use of aromatic plants has been present in all of human history. So there's a lot to discuss there. I'm just going to bullet point some of the most important elements in the history of aromatherapy. I'm going to discuss the standards and safety guidelines for quality control and safe use of essential oils, which is one of the things I'm most passionate about, especially as a relative beginner, amateur to aromatherapy. I'm not necessarily trained clinically in the use of aromatherapy. So as a person who enjoys using it, I think it's really important that I'm using it well and I'm using it respectfully for my health and for the others I offer advice to. So I really like to look at safety and how to use it properly. Uh, I'll definitely go through how to use it practically, offering you some blending guides and different uses of essential oils and their properties. Uh, so we'll definitely look into how to use it at home. And I'll highlight a few popular essential oils and outline their properties so you can know which oils to look for if you want to use them in your life. Um, traditionally, when I give a presentation, I do a question and answer. So what I'll do at the end is offer you some contact information where you can reach me directly and ask me questions on aromatherapy and share some of your own stories. And creating custom blends is also something that I tend to do with our in-person workshops. Right now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't really do group sessions in person. So that custom blending isn't really part of what we're doing today. But I do encourage you, especially if you're here in Pocatello, Idaho, come into the store and see me and I can show you some really great scents. And we also offer little samples of carrier oil where you can add a few drops of oil to your uh, little jar and take it home with you and see what you think. So you can come back and try it before you use it at home. So when you're thinking of aromatherapy, it is considered a branch of phytotherapy. And phytotherapy is a science-based holistic practice which relies on an empirical appreciation of medicinal herbs and which is often linked to traditional knowledge. Um, the empirical appreciation of medicinal herbs I think is really important because in today's world, we want to make sure that what we're using for our health has been proven by science not to discredit the benefit of the traditional use and the spiritual use of aromatherapy um, because it's definitely longstanding in our span of humanity. But if you want to use it specifically for a therapeutic benefit to improve your physical being, it's going to be important that you look at it with a, a clinical scientific eye. And that's why we consider our versions of aromatherapy to be branches of phytotherapy. That would also include using herbal mother tinctures, um, dried bulk herb for concoctions and teas, different encapsulated herbs, diet and nutrition. That's all part of phytotherapy. I am not an expert on anything but the aromatherapy, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. And aromatherapy definitively would be the therapeutic use of essential oils to maintain and promote 
physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. There's a lot of different ways to define aromatherapy. I like that one because it covers the basis of physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And it's focusing on essential oils. Um, and not all aromatic oils are definitively an essential oil. To be considered an essential oil, um, which is a volatile, aromatic, and chemically complex oil, it's important that the essential oil is extracted from the plants through steam distillation. Steam distillation is the process where you take the plant material and put it in either a still or something of that nature, shooting either hot steam through it or boiling it in water, and then flash cooling that steam in a copper tube where the oil of the plant is separated from the water of the plant moved into a collection container where you can collect that oil by skimming off the top and leaving the water. That's a pretty quick description of how a dis distillation process works. Now, there are some essential oils out there that are not steam distilled. They are cold pressed. Probably the most popular and common one is orange oil. And that's where they take the orange peel and press it to remove the essence and collect that. With cold pressed oils, they are going to contain some of the natural waxes and fats from the fruit, whereas the distillation process would be removing those. Um, sometimes with cold pressed oils, you may get a more complex scent or fragrance. Uh, the shelf life may not be as long as the distilled oils, but um, it is one other way to get that essence of the plant. Um, if you actually take an orange peel and squeeze an orange peel, you can see little bits of oil coming out. And that's what we're bottling when we do a cold pressed oil. But in most cases, an essential oil is steam distilled. Um, let's look at the brief history of aromatherapy. It's been part of humanity for so long, rooted in traditional and spiritual practices. Um, there are records of aromatic plants being used medicinally, cosmetically, and spiritually as long ago as ancient Egypt. Um, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, a name that we're all pretty familiar with, prescribed preparations which contained aromatic plants. Greeks used lavender a lot, juniper a lot. Um, so plant medicine was definitely part of their culture. Um, the Persians really... Uh, began to perfect the art of distillation around 1000 AD. Avicenna um, kind of was credited with being the first person to really hone in on the distillation process. They would distill alcohols and they would use those alcohols medicinally. And that's kind of where our current method of distillation began. Um, so, uh, we moved into the scientific revolution of the 19th century and that gave us the opportunity to identify individual chemical constituents that were found within plants, such as caffeine, quinine, morphine. And then we could really see why the plant was making us feel better or helping us in a certain way because now we can see these chemicals that exist in those plants. Um, by the mid 20th century, Modern medicine had improved so much and so many new and exciting things were happening with um, vaccines and all that kind of stuff that the natural medicine and the natural wellness had been overshadowed by the new and exciting things of modern medicine. Um, but there were still people that were passionate about using the plants and knowing how they work and why they work. Um, and in fact, in 1928, Mr. René-Maurice Getfoss coined the term aromatherapy. He's considered the father of aromatherapy. Um, and it's just really fascinating. He was uh, in his lab, oh, pardon me. <clears throat> um, Gat Foss was working in his lab and he had burned his hand on a flame and it was pretty bad. And he had decided to just plunge his hand into the nearest thing of liquid, which happened to be lavender oil. And he marked about how soothing it was and how quickly it healed. And he kind of just took that and ran with it. And uh, we've been 
having a slow growth in popularity from then to today, where aromatherapy is a term that most households have heard. So now that we all know aromatherapy exists, it's everywhere, we can use it, we can find it almost anywhere we go. Um, let's talk about how to control that quality and make sure that what we're using is the best quality we can get. Um, so when a distributor of essential oils, such as Time Labs, where I work, when we are going to um, obtain an essential oil, uh, we want to make sure that it is within the FDA food safety standards for pesticide use, or in most cases, pesticide free. Um, we also want to look at the type of distract extraction. I had mentioned earlier, there is the cold pressed versus the distilled. There are more ways to get essential oils as well. So I discussed the distillation process, the cold pressed process. Enfleurage is one that's pretty interesting. Um, with enfleurage, it's a solvent extraction. And that's usually used with very precious floral um, essential oils because these plant parts, the flower petals are so delicate, the distillation process tends to be a little too harsh for that extraction. So with enfleurage, traditionally what they do is take a sheet of glass, a large pane of glass, and they'll cover that glass with um, a natural fat substance. In the past, they used tallow or animal fat. I think today, from what I understand, there's some more natural versions, um, non animal versions of fat that can be used. And they'll take, for instance, jasmine flowers. They'll wait until the jasmine is in full bloom at night when it's the most aromatic. And they'll take the flowers and they'll lay them on those panes of glass and let them soak into the oil. Um, they'll leave them there until it cannot offer any more fragrance. They'll pluck out the old ones and add new ones until the process is complete. And through a controlled temperature boil, they will separate the essence from that fatty substance. And that's when you get the absolute. Absolutes are, tend to be a little more concentrated, used mainly in perfumery and fragrance. Um, you'll see a rose absolute, jasmine absolute, um, and they also tend to be somewhat less expensive than the distilled essential oil. Uh, so that's another version. And one of the most new versions of essential oil extraction would be CO2 extraction. Um, that's where they use a very controlled chamber and carbon dioxide to find that perfect temperature where the plant releases the essence. Um, I have not educated myself uh, thoroughly on the CO2 extraction but I have used some CO2 extracts. Uh, for instance, I had a vanilla that was a CO2 extract and it was amazing, very fragrant. A little bit went a very long way. Those essential oils tend to be a little bit uh, more fragrant um, and they also tend to be a little bit more expensive because of the process of extraction costs more. Um, I imagine we'll be seeing a lot more CO2 oils offered in the future. Another part of quality control is making sure that you're having an analysis done on the oils you obtain. So the most common form of analysis for essential oils would be the gas chromatography mass spectrometry or GCMS uh, analysis. That's when they take gas and light to measure the specific organic compounds and molecules that are found in those essential oils. Essential oils can contain up to three to 500 organic compounds. Rose, for instance, has chemicals in it that have yet to be identified. Isn't that wild? So um, taking those analysis is really important because you can look at those and you can see whether or not a pesticide has been used. You can read it and see whether or not it's been adulterated or if it really is what it claims to be. Um, we at Time Laboratories use a third party laboratory for our GCMS testing because we feel that's an ethical way to get an analysis of the oils that we can show to our consumer where we can be very transparent. Um, and so a third party laboratory is, is something that it, most companies could be doing to really show that they care about high quality control. Uh, 
Being bottled and labeled correctly is also a great way to ensure that the oil you're purchasing is a good quality oil. Um, I brought a bottle here. So lavender is one of the most common oils out there. It's got a lot of uses, it's very popular. It's safe and gentle to use for most people. And the lavender bottle I have here states the common name, which is lavender. And that's backwards, sorry. Um, the other thing you're gonna wanna see on your label is the uh, botanical name or the scientific name, Latin name. Here we have Lavandula angustifolia vera. Um, now that shows us that this is a true uh, lavender. There are different types of lavender out there. For instance, Lavandula spicata is spike lavender. It has different properties than Lavandula angustifolia. So it's gonna be important that you look at that. Um, we have lavandin, which is a hybrid of different types of lavender. Less expensive to cultivate, less expensive to offer, and sometimes it is sold as true lavender when it really isn't true lavender, because it, and people won't catch it because it smells the same. So make sure you're looking at that botanical name as well so you know what you're getting. Happens with mint too. Sometimes peppermint um, will be labeled as peppermint, but it's really corn mint. And so buyer beware. Um, that's why the label on the bottle is really important. Uh, you also want to make sure uh, you have the type of plant or the part of the plant being used, for instance, the flower. Some essential oils, you're using the leaves and twigs of the plant. Some essential oils, you're using the heartwood of a tree, uh, the rhizome or the root the berries. Um, so let's look at the orange blossom. Uh, neroli oil is delicious. Uh, very citrusy, very musky, really fragrant oil. And that is the bloom of the rose of the orange blossom. And then you have pettigrain, which is the same exact plant as neroli, the orange blossom plant. However, it's the leaves and the twigs versus the flower. Um, when you look at a, a tree, uh, you can see that there's the ratio of leaves and twigs to flowers is way bigger. So to cultivate the pedigree, it's not as expensive. Um, and when you distill the oil, it shares some of the fragrant properties of neroli, pedigree does, but it definitely doesn't smell the same. They share some of the same properties as well, um, but they are very different in price too. A uh, little story here, I had a customer come in who's an aromatherapy enthusiast. Hi, Chris, if you're watching. And he uh, was wondering why our neroli oil was more expensive than the bottle he had purchased from a different company. And I kind of explained to him what I just mentioned about the neroli versus pedigree. I had him smell both of those. And he had marked that, you know what? the neroli that he had purchased for a better price than what he saw with us smelled a lot more like pedigree than it did like neroli. So uh, it's kind of important, you know, to understand that too. So when you're buying essential oils, you're looking at the part of the plant being used. Um, also, country of origin is really important. This is a Bulgarian lavender. We also at Time Labs sell a French lavender. Our French lavender is grown at a high altitude. That matters because the rocky soil, the harsh temperatures, that climate makes the plant have to work harder to survive and thrive. So when you go into still that oil that's grown at the high altitude, you can see that the chemicals the plant creates to thrive and survive in that harsh climate transfers into the essential oil. It's a richer oil as far as it has more constituents in it. And it's a little more recommended for therapeutic use because of that. So the um, country of origin is also very important. Um, also, every bottle of essential oil you buy should be able to be traced back to its original um, source. And that's often done through a lot number. I don't know if you can see the lot number on there, but that's often a little number somewhere on the label or the bottle to show that the company has kept track of where this oil is coming from and how where it goes back to. So those are all very important things to consider when purchasing essential oils for quality control. 
I like to tell people that because essential oils have become so popular, <clears throat> it's a common phrase all over, people are selling them from their homes, that increase in popularity has really shown an increase in scams. Um, I've seen posts on social media about people finding great prices at dollar stores for essential oils, at big box stores for essential oils. And when scientists take those and actually do the GCMS testing on them, it's alarming to see how fraudulent that oil really is. So um, just, you know, take the time to do your research, look at the company that you're buying from, check out their reviews, talk to their quality control manager, ask these questions um, to just kind of make sure that you're getting a good quality product. There's so many great businesses out there that are offering these wonderful things. Um, so don't be too afraid, but uh, just make sure you know that if it seems too good to be true, it might be. Okay. Um, this is a little quote I wanted to mention from Salvador Battaglia's book, The Complete Guide uh, to Aromatherapy, third edition. Salvatore is an Australian aromatherapist, really kind of a brilliant man with a very strong passion for aromatherapy. Um, I was introduced to him through the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. I'm gonna discuss a little bit more about them. This is his book, which is one of my favorite books. It is truly a textbook for aromatherapy. He goes through and does so much research. In fact, reading this book kind of has made it so I didn't have to read my other books because he references all these other books I've read. Um, but yeah, this is a quote from him there. And it's, oh, too far. And it is uh, kind of touching on that quality control and scamming so to speak, that I mentioned. So he says, there is a concern that if someone reads a bit about essential oils, they think they are then qualified to tell others how to use essential oils. This situation undermines the qualifications and experience of professionally trained aromatherapists and also puts the public at risk of unsafe usage recommendations. It is imperative that aromatherapy is promoted with integrity. Um, integrity is a key word there. Um, Miraculous claims need to be checked by science. Um, there are a lot of scientific studies that shown that, you know, lavender is sedative, ylang, ylang can lower blood pressure, rose water can ease anxiety. But if someone comes up to you and says frankincense will cure your cancer, there's no research study that's done that. So just, yeah, integrity in essential oils is important and make sure like for instance, me, I don't claim to offer any clinical advice on aromatherapy. So um, yeah, just uh, make sure you're working with people who you trust and can ensure your safety. And this is gonna be moving into our next topic, which is more about quality from the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy or NAHA. Their uh, disclaimer here is Terms such as therapeutic grade, pharmaceutical grade, and medicinal grade are not regulated aromatherapy terms and therefore have little meaning. They're often used merely for marketing purposes. So if a company comes to you and says, these are medicinal grade essential oils, that's their claim and there's no proof to it. Not to say they can't be used medicinally very safely and effectively, but there's not really any oversight to prove that or disprove that. Um, so it's more important that you look at a company's claim that their essential oils are pure and genuine of a single species, pesticide free, um, GCMS tested. Uh, those are the key words you should be looking at and really not focusing on the grade or of essential oils, if that makes sense. Now let's move on to my favorite part of the presentation, safety practices. I can't tell you how many times people come into my store and talk about essential oils. I'll say, oh, how are you gonna be using this oil? And they tell me something that makes my heart stop. It's not my practice, not my business to tell people how to use essential oils in their personal lives. But I do tend to mention that goes against safety guidelines. 
of the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy because yeah, some of them are kind of scary. Um, always keep essential oils out of reach of children. They're in cute little blue bottles, they smell good. They could be very attractive to children. Um, however, they could be very dangerous, especially some that are on lists of toxicity. Also, you don't want to lose a very expensive bottle of oil. So just keep them away from kids. <laughs> That's the best idea to do. Um, avoid synthetic and fragrance oils, especially for therapeutic use. Um, there are a lot of you know, things out there to make your house smell good, but a cinnamon spray for your home probably is not the same thing as a cinnamon bark or cinnamon leaf essential oils. So don't use fragrance or synthetic grade oils to get any sort of therapeutic benefit, especially topically. Um, if you're using essential oils and you notice an irritation occurs, discontinue use. That could be signs of a, an allergic reaction to the essential oils or a certain sensitivity. So watch for that. Test spots are always really important. Find a spot on your body that you can do a little bit of a test spot on to see if your skin reacts or if you react to it. Avoid contact with eyes. Never, 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 ever use essential oils in your eyes. Not to say you can't use plant uh, parts in your eye. So what am I trying to say here? Um, chamomile. Chamomile tea from the chamomile flower that has been boiled sterilely in proper equipment, cooled, can be used on your eyes as a cold compress for things like conjunctivitis, eye irritation, dry eye itch, to provide a nice soothingness to it. However, if you used essential, uh, essential oil of chamomile in your eye, you could do permanent damage. Um, I kind of equate it to a cup of chamomile tea maybe uses a handful of flowers. A drop of chamomile oil uses a lot of chamomile flowers, maybe even two, three pounds of chamomile flowers. So if you're thinking about that concentration, it's just so much in the essential oil versus the tea. Um, so just never use essential oils in your eyes. Um, it's important to use them in a well-ventilated area, especially over a long time, um, because they're very powerful and very aromatic. They can cause headaches if not used in a well-ventilated area. Um, so just to make sure that you uh, have some fresh air when you're using aromatherapy. Avoid internal or undiluted use unless you're working with a qualified aromatherapist or healthcare practitioner. Specifically internal use, that's probably the most common error I see with people using aromatherapy in their personal life is that they're taking them internally in ways that go against these guidelines. Not to say you can't use essential oils internally, internally for their therapeutic and medicinal benefit, but doing so in most cases, you're doing it in a dilution that is so small. Some of the dilutions I've taken personally with essential oils in them, each dose I ingest contains less than a drop of essential oil, not even a full drop in a dose. That's how concentrated they are. And undiluted use on your skin topically is also something that is commonly used. Don't just take the bottle and put it right on your skin. That could cause dermal irritation. That could cause skin sensitivity. That could cause nerve damage. Um, so in dilution is really important. Probably the only essential oil that can really ever be used neat or undiluted would be lavender, true lavender that's pretty recognized across the board as being safe. However, diluting it will not lower its benefit and it will stretch the oil a little bit farther. So uh, make sure that if you are using them internally or undiluted, that you have a qualified health professional offering you that advice and monitoring you. More safety practices, storing essential oils and vegetable oils, carrier oils in a sealed container away from light and heat. This will extend their shelf life, keep them uh, pure, um, unadulterated. Um, oxidization is gonna be the thing that makes your oils go bad, which you can usually smell after a long time. Um, so 
just, you know, you'll often see these amber colored glass bottles or the blue glass bottles. That's not just aesthetic. That is to protect against light damage or UV damage. Um, you also want to keep them away from high temperatures, from moisture. Um, a lot of people will be storing their essential oils in their medicine cabinet in their bathroom. It's not really the best place for it because bathrooms tend to get a lot of moisture through steamy showers and stuff like that. So I would uh, encourage you to just find a cool dark place in your home away from your kids and your pets where you can store your oils. I have a little old camera bag that I repurposed. I love it for storage because it's padded um, and I can just throw it over my shoulder and go anywhere with it. Before using an essential oil, become familiar with its uses, safety, and therapeutic properties. Um, lots of great guides out there. Call someone who works for Time Labs and I'll explain to you which oils can be good for what. Um, but just don't use them without any education because cinnamon bark smells amazing, but if you use cinnamon bark on your skin, it's gonna burn. Um, ensure all the oils you use and purchase are authentic essential oils. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, do not use photosensitizing oils prior to going into a sun tanning booth or into direct sun. Um, photosensitization occurs when uh, a citrus essential oil in most cases, um, the biggest culprit there is true bergamot oil. That's when you apply it to your skin, you go out into the sun, and the sunlight reacts to the chemicals in that oil and actually enhance the sun's reaction on the skin. Um, bergamot oil, some citrus oils, lime, angelica root, all have photosensitizing properties, so just please be careful. Um, we, you can purchase um, essential oils that have been manipulated. So for instance, Time Laboratories, offers a bergamot essential oil that is free of furocoumarin, which is that chemical agent that reacts to the sun. Um, we also offer the bergamot essential oil with that furocoumarin, so you can get the true oil to use, but we don't really offer that just to anybody. We tend to uh, offer that with the guidance that you're using it, with the knowledge that you have to be very careful. Um, so use essential oils in low concentrations, less than 2% for children during pregnancy and for the elderly. Um, children, expecting mothers, and the elderly, their systems tend to be more susceptible to overexposure of essential oils and uh, irritation. So um, using low concentrations can guarantee that you can still get the benefits by not increasing the risk of problems. It's going to be important to use extra caution, especially with children 10 years and younger, with these oils. Um, a lot of these oils are considered warming oils, um, which are going to cause a little bit of heat on the skin. So take a look at this list and just make sure if you have these in your cabinet, you're not necessarily using them on children 10 and younger, unless you're doing it in very, very low dilutions. Um, and monitoring um, its use for any sort of reaction. <clears throat> Use extreme caution, <coughs> pardon me, with wintergreen, birch, and cinnamon bark. These ones are very powerful and not really recommended for just common everyday use, unless it's in very, very low dilutions, less than 1% even. If you'd like to, you know, do some more research on the safe use of essential oils or would like to have a copy of this for yourself, please check out that link, go to the naha.org website and explore their safety of aromatherapy. Okay, we've gone through the quality. We've talked about safe practices. Now let's talk about how to use essential oils. You've got this bottle, what do you do with it? Well, the best thing to do is start with a good quality base or carrier oil. That's a vegetable oil, a natural lotion, alcohol, distilled water, <clears throat> a natural bath gel. Um, I brought a couple of examples here. Again, they're backwards, but... So jojoba oil tends to be my favorite for skincare. 
because it resembles the sebum that the skin produces on its own and it blends into the skin really well. There's not really much fragrance to it. Um, I, we've added vitamin E for a longer shelf life. Um, well, there's things like sweet almond oil, which tends to be a little bit better for massage. It's got a wetter glide for body work. Um, but yeah, these vegetable oils are common carrier oils. You could use olive oil, um, grapeseed oil, coconut oil. Um, just make sure it's good quality. Avoid anything with synthetic chemicals in it or a lot of uh, drying agents or synthetic fragrances. Um, natural body balm bases, natural lotion bases can be found through aromatherapy companies. We have some at Time Labs where you add your oils to it. Um, and it's just really fun to kind of create your own products. <clears throat> Dilution is imperative in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Dilution will <clears throat> lower your risk of dermal irritation, like I mentioned. Dilution will prevent rapid evaporation. So if I put a drop of lavender essential oil undiluted on my hand, it'll be gone within a few minutes because it's going to want to evaporate. They're very volatile. If I take that same drop of lavender oil, put it in a teaspoon of grapeseed oil and put it in my hand, it's going to stay there so much longer and you're going to have that scent so much longer um, because it's grounded in that carrier. So um, dilution is just really important at uh, preventing that rapid evaporation. and It'll extend the use of your oil per drop. And dilution doesn't really lower the effectiveness of the oil. People think, oh, if I take that lavender and dilute it, it's not gonna be as strong when I use it. It's not gonna do the same thing as if I use it straight. That's not necessarily the case. Um, so dilution is just a wise choice all around. And then consider just the, general fragrant quality of the essential oil. My personal opinion, like with lavender for, or lemongrass, for example, um, less tends to be more. It's very powerful oil as far as its aroma and it can overpower other oils. So when I use lemongrass in a blend, I try and limit it to just one drop at a time because if I'd use two or three more drops than I expect, all you're gonna smell is that lemongrass. <clears throat> and then, there are essential oils like patchouli, cedarwood, sandalwood, that the longer they sit in a blend, the stronger they'll be over time. So that just kind of comes with time and experience to kind of understand that subtle nature of the essential oil and its, uh, its um, quality and blends. So, you know, keep your a journal for yourself as you're making blends, as you're using oils, Talk about how it smells to you, um, what kind of experience you're getting from your blends. Was it too heavy on this aroma? Was it too light on this aroma? And keep track of that. So the next time you go to use it, you're not um, going against what you want. <clears throat> um, it's gonna be important to invest in proper tools if you're gonna be using aromatherapy. Um, amateurs and professionals. Uh, glass is ideal. Glass is great because you can clean it and sterilize it so easily. Um, however, it can be expensive. And PET plastic is probably the most commonly used. PET grade plastic is very important because it is durable enough that it won't um, lose its integrity from the caustic nature of essential oils. So here's a little story for you. Um, several months ago, I don't know, within the last year probably, um, a bottle of fennel oil had spilled and broken at our location, which, you know, it happens. Um, it's unfortunate, but that happens. Um, and we had fennel essential oil on our floor. So we go, we mop it up, we're trying to clean it up. I look down and I see all these little black marks on my floor. I'm thinking, what are those? Well, it was the rubber sole from my shoes that had stepped in that spilled fennel oil and the fennel oil had been eating away at the rubber and I was leaving little rubber stamps everywhere. That's kind of an example of how powerful these essential oils are that they can eat through rubber and liquefy rubber so that I can leave rubber imprints everywhere. 
That's why it's going to be really important to dilute it, but also why you need to use containers that won't let that happen. So like this beaker, it's a PET grade plastic. I can fill this with oil and it's going to not leach any chemicals. Um, so yeah, there's my little story about that. Eye droppers and pipettes with milliliter measurements are great. So disposable pipettes like this are awesome. You probably can't see it, but this is marked one milliliter, two milliliters, three milliliters. Since aromatherapy was kind of originated um, in European uh, medicine and practices, it's based off of milliliters. Um, and so <clears throat> a half ounce bottle is 15 milliliters. So finding those beakers that have those graduated measurements is gonna be really important too. It's gonna to help you with your blending ratios and your math. And again, storage is important. I mentioned my camera bag earlier. I love it, I use it all the time, it's great. <clears throat> um, if you're using aromatherapy therapeutically, massage therapists, nursing, or even just during your home, consider doing a diffuser that is a nebulizer type or an airstream diffuser. <clears throat> There are a lot of diffusers out there that are great for fragrancing your home and scenting your home where you add drops of essential oil to water. It gets heated into a vapor and then that vapor comes up. Those are cute. They light up and they do smell great. However, the Airstream diffuser is a better choice for therapy because it's not diluting the oils in anything. You're using the oils as is straight from the bottle and you're not adding any heat. It's an airstream that vaporizes those oils, not heat. Um, so much chemistry goes into why essential oils work. And when we think back to our junior high, high school chemistry class, we learned that temperature can affect the quality of organic compounds and molecules. So um, it would make sense that adding heat to an essential oil can change its molecular structure and property. <clears throat> um, use a heat pack or a cool rice pack to help make aromatherapy treatments more effective. So you can use your aromatherapy dilution and massage, rub it on your joints, on your muscles, and then after that's applied, you can put on a hot pack or an ice pack to either help with inflammation or pain or swelling. Um, it's just something that can aid in that therapeutic use. Don't overdo it when you're making blends. Work a drop at a time and begin with test spots. Um, my best practice is to keep a little notepad nearby where I can tally mark. If I'm making a blend, I'll take this beaker. Um, in a lot of cases, I'll put maybe a teaspoon or a tablespoon of a carrier oil in there so that as I'm making my blends a drop at a time, they're not gonna just evaporate. And what I'll do is, yeah, just Grab my first oil, put in one drop. Okay, I've got one drop of lavender in there. Mark it down. Let's say I wanna mix it with peppermint. Um, they're very different oils, they have different qualities. Let's do one drop of lavender, one drop of peppermint. Smell it, mark it. Okay, that smells good. I think I want it to be a little stronger in the peppermint. So I'll add one more drop of peppermint to my one drop of lavender, two drops of peppermint. And then I can kind of gauge at a time. Oh, you know what? That's a little too much. So let's go back to two drops of lavender, two drops of peppermint, even it out again, it's perfect. Um, keeping those notes, keeping those tallies can kind of help you not overwork or overdo. That way you can look at your final blend and look at those percentages, how many drops to other drops, and that way you can increase that into larger uh, blends. Something that takes practice, something that takes a little bit of finesse, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, let's look at the practical use of aromatherapy for massage specifically. Most dilutions for massage are going to be a 2.5% or to a 5% dilution. If you're doing a full body massage, more towards the 2.5%. If you're just doing a small part of your body, like your elbow or your shoulders, you can go up to that 5% dilution. Um, but you don't want to cover your entire body in a high dilution because it's going to be too much. Um, those dilutions can equal to about 15 to 30 drops of essential oil per ounce of carrier. Each essential oil drop is a different size based on its, um, uh, based on its 
uh, viscosity or um, thickness. So let's say patchouli, very thick oil. Vetiver, very thick, drops slower. Um, peppermint, eucalyptus, those are thin oils. They drop a little bit quicker. Um, so just kind of understand that. That's why milliliter measurements are also kind of important. Volume of milliliter versus drops. Um, but there is a basic dilution guide for you. Using a vegetable oil, grape sweet, sweet almond. Like I said, jojoba can be used to massage, but only really for facial massage and facial things because it is a little more expensive and it's not going to stay wet as long as the others. You can also use a massage lotion. Just avoid anything that's scented and try and find as natural as possible for, you know, your natural wellness. And you can also use a natural lotion, um, which is probably similar to a massage lotion. Some massage lotions are medicated with Arnica or MSM, where it's just a hydrating body lotion. You don't necessarily need that. Um, inhalation is another way to use essential oils. Inhalation is breathing it in, smelling it. Probably the most commonly used way, most common way to use aromatherapy. With inhalation, what you're doing is you're getting those microscopic uh, aromatic compounds floating into your nose. They connect to your um, olfactory sense and trigger your brain. Um, so that can be really good, especially for emotional support. However, getting that essential oil into your lungs goes right into your bloodstream as well. So inhalation isn't just for a spiritual or um, mental support. It can be a physical support as well, especially for lung health. Um, ways to do aromatherapy through inhalation, 15 to 20 drops of oil tube or a little glass jar and just um, smelling on that. It's great. Um, 15 to 20 drops uh, on a cotton handkerchief or tissue, same way. And while you're watching TV, just kind of have that in your pocket, have it in your hand and just smell on it. Um, it'll be really nice and kind of help you with your therapeutic use. In a pinch, you can, if you just want your house to smell good and you're not worried about any sort of therapeutic benefits, you just want a good smell, put three to seven drops into boiling water and put it on your stove. Or um, take that boiling water off the stove, add those drops, cover your head with a towel, and kind of use an inhalation, a steam inhalation for your sinuses. Make sure to keep your eyes closed during that process under the towel because you can get the essential oil burning or stinging your eyes. And um, yeah, that's really good for asthma, for allergies, to kind of clear the lungs. You can use inhalation through a diffuser. Look at your diffuser's directions and kind of follow those for the best use. Baths are one of my favorite ways to use aromatherapy because it's just really feeling like you're treating yourself when you're taking a nice aromatic bath. Um, don't, you know, take a bath with aromatherapy unless you're really going to commit to this relaxing and soaking. Um, you want to spend about 20 to 30 minutes in that bath. Two to, ten, two to 12 drops into a teaspoon of dispersing agent. So if I'm using, oh, let me think, um, a really strong scented oil, I'll stick to two drops. Like, um, I don't know, patchouli. It's a pretty strong oil. You wouldn't need much to fragrance your bath water. Whereas like um, lavender, you could go up to 12 drops. And when I say dispersing agent, I mean a natural bath gel, um, coconut emulsifier is great. You could use a fatty milk or vodka. What those are gonna do is they're gonna make that essential oil easily disperse in the water. Otherwise, it's gonna sit in a film on the top. You could use vegetable oil as well, vegetable oil as well. However, please be careful because that vegetable oil can leave your tub very slippery and that's a fall risk. So um, I find that a natural um, unscented bath gel is the best way. We sell one at Time Labs, which is my favorite. It kind of gives a little bit of a foaming action, but it really does disperse the oil through your whole bath water. Add that diluted essential oil to a full bath and stir just before entering. What I like to do is take my bath gel and pour it under the, the spout as it's finishing filling up the tub. 
That way it can just really kind of get through that water. Um, be cautious that very hot bath water might be more stimulating than relaxing right before bed. So um, if you're trying to take a relaxing nighttime bath, don't make it too hot or you'll get your circulation going too much. And then yeah, give yourself time to soak for 15 to 20 minutes. This shouldn't be a scrub down, wash your hair, wash your face kind of situation. This is just for therapeutic use. Put on a playlist, turn out the lights and just relax. Don't fall asleep in the tub, but you know what I mean. Um, you can also do just like foot baths or half baths where you're just soaking the lower half of your body. Um, hand soaks for manicures and pedicures are really nice. So that's a way to do it um, at home. Um, according to Salvatore's research, love this guy, love this book, um, use caution with oils in the bath that have high percentage of monoterpene hydrocarbons. There's that chemistry that I'm not an expert in. Um, I'll let the professionals use those terms, but like lemon, grapefruit, and sweet orange. I didn't know this until I looked at this book that you might want to avoid using those in the bath. Something about the water um, reacting and on the skin. Uh, so just use caution there. Um, also use caution with oils that contain phenols and aldehydes. Those are listed here. Um, so look at those and kind of understand that if you're taking an aromatic bath, maybe just use extra caution with these oils. If you do experience irritation while in the bath, immediately vacate the bath and wash the affected area in a shower with soapy water to reduce irritation. Um, that's really good advice. So thank you, Sal, for um, making sure that we're taking our aromatic baths the right way. Spritzers are also a very popular way. These can be used as body spritzers, aura spritzers, room sprays, pillow mists, um, topical sprays for itchy skin, um, insect repellent, that kind of thing. Um, 10 to 15 drops per ounce of water. So um, if you're using a four ounce water bottle, you could do 40 drops to 60 drops of essential oil. Using, of course, again, a PET plastic bottle if glass is not available. Um, you wanna, when you're making water dilutions, add equal parts coconut emulsifier or alcohol or other dispersing agent to help the waters disperse. Water and oil don't mix, so if you're putting drops of essential oil into water, it's just gonna sit on a film on the top. You can shake it up, shake it up, shake it up, and it's just gonna separate back onto the top there. So adding that coconut emulsifier, which is a product specifically made to disperse the essential oils in water, means that you can shake it once before use and not have to worry about constantly shaking it. You will still get separation over time, but it's not a matter of constantly shaking. Um, shake before use. <laughs> and avoid contact with your eyes. For like a facial spray, make sure your eyes are closed. Um, for uh, fabric sprays and pill mists, be careful because some essential oils and blends can actually bleach fabrics or stain fabrics. So use, it, use a test spot somewhere to make sure you're not I'm going against what you want to do. Here's an example of lavender fields. You can see those beautiful green and purple bushes. Um, lavender is one of the most common used essential oils with a multitude of uses. These um, benefits through clinical studies come from this book, like I had said. Um, lavender can be used for pain relief, inflammation, Lavender, as well as so many essential oils, are naturally antimicrobial, antispasmodic, anxiolytic, so it can help with anxiety, hypotensive, it can help with your blood pressure, sedative is probably the most commonly thing, thing that lavender is used for, restorative for skin care, and more. Um, like I said, lowering blood pressure, palpitation, burns. Lavender is great for burns, sunburns, and burns on the skin from heat. Wound healing is good too. Um, I believe in the First World War, lavender was used a lot in the battlefields because it was antiseptic and it was able to help with wounds on the battlefield. But there were generations after World War I 
that would get PTSD from the smell of the lavender. So that's kind of interesting. Um, lavender can be used for muscle and joint pain, stress and anxiety, insomnia, huge with insomnia. Lavender is great for that. Um, PMS and menstrual pain, asthma, it's so anti-inflammatory that your airways can be calmed through its inhalation. And lavender can be used as an insect repellent and be soothing on bites. This is peppermint, one of the most other, one of the other most commonly used essential oils, mentha peprita. Um, the therapeutic benefits through clinical studies there are, again, pain relieving, very common for that. Um, antimicrobial, antispasmodic, antiviral, choleretic, insecticidal. Um, a lot of people will say that peppermint will keep mice away and it's just surely an insecticide and pest deterrent. Pain relief is huge. Lavender mixed with peppermint is great for headaches. Lavender kind of gives that relaxing agent, whereas peppermint kind of gives that stimulating agent, which I've seen equated to uh, pain relievers with caffeine added. That's a kind of interesting equation. Um, pe peppermint's great for the stomach. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, a nice kind of, um, Clockwise rubbing of the stomach is a really great way to uh, ease uh, stomach issues. Lavender or peppermint is very energizing. It's going to increase circulation. It's going to wake you up. Um, and it can also be helpful for coughs and colds. Peppermint may occasionally be sensitizing, not recommended for use on young children. And I do recommend diluting it for topical use um, because it can burn your skin. Um, here's a fun plant that is often used um, in cooking and culinary. It is rosemary. Rosemary is one of those traditional plants that have been used for a long time. Um, supported by clinical studies is an antifungal, carminative to help with flatulence, a cephalic oil, which, which means it can stimulate brain function, digestive, hepata, hep, hepata, a protective, that word, I don't know. That means it's going to be a, a liver tonic. It's going to help your liver and kidney system. Uh, Nervine and a general tonic. Rosemary is pretty fortifying. Um, for a heart tonic, uh, cardiac fatigue and low blood pressure, circulatory problems. On the other end of that, if you have hypertension or high blood pressure, rosemary is an oil you might want to avoid because it can increase blood pressure. Um, great for gastric dyspepsia or flatulence, gallbladder infections, uh, gallstones, rheumatism, arthritis, general soreness. Rosemary is going to increase circulation and increase blood flow, provide some warming action for rheumatism. Um, it's great for poor concentration and mental fatigue. As Ophelia said in Hamlet from Shakespeare, Rosemary for Remembrance. It's often been used as a brain herb. Um, and it can, it's often traditionally recommended for hair loss and dandruff as a scalp treatment. Again, it increases that circulation. You're getting blood flow up into those areas, which can benefit in promoting those cells to work a little bit harder. Uh, here's one that probably isn't very recognizable to the common person, but when you smell it, it's easily recognizable. This is tea tree, I believe. Yes, okay, Melaleuca alternifolia. There's a lot of different Melaleuca plants. Cajaput, Nayuli um, are both relatives of tea tree as Melaleuca plants. Tea tree is probably the most commonly used. It's got that triforce of effectiveness as an antibacterial, antifungal, and antimicrobial. So tea tree is great for fungal infections on the skin. Um, it can be anti-inflammatory, antiseptic, antiviral, an insecticide. It's great for keeping um, bugs away. Um, lots of uses in aromatherapy. Um, I do find that you might want to dilute tea tree a little bit more than some others because it can be a little harsh and you want to avoid using it with um, pets sometimes. But great for uh, the following things. Acne is really recommended. However, tea tree can also promote sweating, so I recommend using it in low dilutions. I tried using tea tree as a facial oil once, and it actually made me break out more, and I think it's because it was promoting that sweating. So if I had used it in smaller dilutions, it might have been more effective. Um, super deodorizing, too. 
great for athletes, foot, ringworm, fungal skin infections, um, cold sores. A lot of people will say getting tea tree on a cold sore right when it's appearing can help it from surfacing. Um, dandruff, insect bites, tea tree has been recommended for warts, um, scabies, dust mites, head lice, washing my linens with tea tree sometimes gives me some peace of mind. Um, on, oh, before we move on, I also like to say, um, if you do your laundry and you forget your wash in the washer and you get that mildewy smell, add about 40 drops of tea tree to your next, to that load of wash and, in the rinse cycle and it should help fight against that mildewy smell, which is really hard to get rid of once it's there. Um, this plant is one that's really popular as well. We're looking here at eucalyptus. Uh, lots of different types of eucalyptus. I'm gonna focus on radiata and globulus. Um, there's also a eucalyptus citriodora, which is a lemon scented eucalyptus. And its main purpose is gonna be for insect repellent because it smells so much like citronella. It's, it's commonly used there. But most eucalyptuses have the actions listed here. Um, antitussive, a decongestant, really eucalyptus is great for lung support, um, getting mucus out of there, kind of uh, really supporting uh, respiratory health. Also recommended often for shingles, cold sores, herpes, insect bites. Eucalyptus can be helpful for muscle and joint pain. And again, the decongestant and the cough and cold action is really popular with eucalyptus. Um, so yeah, that's my presentation for today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I haven't ever done a podcast recorded webinar before. So this was a learning experience for me. Hopefully when I rewatch this, I won't cringe too much and I'll be doing more for you. Um, I always like to say that these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. Any claims that I make are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent diseases. Another thing I like to do is make sure you know where my references are coming from. Um, a lot of the information I gave you today, I don't want to claim uh, credit for. This is the information that has been compiled through so many amazing aromatherapists. So the books that I mostly used in this presentation are Aromatherapy, An A to Z by Patricia Davis, uh, published in 1988 by C.W. Daniel Company. This is a fun book that goes through a to Z of not just aromatherapy and essential oils, but different things like um, compresses, concrete, contagious diseases, coughs, coriander. Um, really fun book with a lot of great guides in it. Already mentioned The Complete Guide to Aromatherapy, the third edition, volume one, Foundations of Materia Medica by Salvador Battaglia, 2018, Black Pepper Creative Press. Um, I'm really excited for volume two, uh, because he's going to talk a lot more about the olfaction process. Um, if you get a chance, this is a really good book too. I love it. Um, I believe he will be the keynote speaker for Naha 2021 in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I can't wait to get him to sign my copy. Hopefully I can get that to happen. And I've also used, of course, the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. Um, this is a just a really brochure for them, but they have so much information on their website. I am a friend of aromatherapy member in the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy, and Time Laboratories is also a corporate member of the, um, and sponsor of the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy, as well as the World of Aromatherapy Conference that I mentioned in 2021. Um, thank you so much for being here again today. Um, I'm just thrilled to be here to share my love of aromatherapy for you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me for any questions. You can find my contact information at www.shoptimelabs.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Time Laboratories, on Facebook at Time Laboratories, and we've just started a Pinterest board under Time Laboratories. Again, my name is Philip Shepard. I'm here to help you with your aromatherapy adventures. So please uh, enjoy, do it safely, do it smart, and improve your well being with aromatherapy. Have a great day.